Welcome and uh, thank you for, for joining us on this special uh, video webinar uh, looking at convening for School Improvement Council during the time of a pandemic uh, because convening your School Improvement Council it's more important than ever right now. Uh, I'm Tom Hudson, I'm Executive Director of the South Carolina School Improvement Council and I'm pleased also to be co-director of the Carolina Family Engagement Center and I'm here with Karen Utter. Karen? Hey everyone, I'm Karen Utter, um, Associate Director of the South Carolina School Improvement Council as well as Project Director for the Carolina Family Engagement Center. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, our objective for this uh, webinar is to uh, get you um, all the information that you need to feel comfortable uh, convening your SIC during the pandemic. So with that, we're going to get started. So one of the things that I've thought about a lot since the pandemic um, started uh, back in the spring of this year um, is how it has impacted um, folks' views on family engagement. And I would have to say that in many conversations with both families and with schools, um, the answer to the question is generally that it has really prompted people to see family engagement as at least as important, if not more so, than they did uh, prior to. And I think the, the reason for that is it really has highlighted um, particularly school closures and, and the need to do some of our work at home virtually has really uh, illustrated the sort of um, interdependent nature of relationships between school and family and community um, in terms of supporting our children's learning and development. Um, school family partnerships are, are really critical right now. And I think that this particular opportunity um, is going to lead to a lot of create, creativity and innovation in family engagement that hopefully we can continue even after the pandemic is concluded and we're all hopefully back to a new normal. Um, so one kind of decision making or one kind of family engagement that is um, part of sort of the, the six types of engagement that um, we think about in terms of the different types of family engagement is family voice in school decision making. And that's really what we're focusing on when we're talking about school improvement councils. So it's more important than ever to include parents in decision making during this time um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, when we have all the folks at the table um, we make better informed decisions. Um, and so parents are going to be bringing a lot of information to the table when we include them that are, are, are really gonna help to um, inform and uh, inform decision-making and, and help it to be decisions that are most effective for students. Um, how do we get that information? we really need to be intentional about, about creating opportunities for parents to share that information. Um, it may be information about how their child learns. It may be information about how their child is doing with virtual learning. It may be information about what kind of internet service they have or don't have, um, what kinds of barriers they face in terms of staying home with their child. There are just all kinds of factors um, that we can't know without asking families. Um, and families can also help us when we collaborate with them, both in planning and problem solving. So in other words, when, when we're planning different alternatives for returning to school, um, we may think that we've considered every aspect of it, but having parents at the table they can bring a whole new lens and, and they can help us to identify problems that maybe we didn't see, but that will be readily apparent to them. Um, and then once those, those plans are in place and we're trying to implement, if they're not working, why aren't they working? Um, 
sometimes it will be apparent, sometimes it won't, but parents may come up with new and creative approaches to solve problem solving, um, and they can really help you hone in on what's working, what's not, and how you might be able to adjust things to make things more effective. Overall, it just leads to better results. It may be messier and more time consuming up front, but it sure can save a lot of time on the back end. So that's just a few of the reasons why it's important to include those parent voices. So how do you do that? Um, I know many schools have been, and districts and the State Department of Education have been very proactive, um, particularly in the early days of, of the pandemic in terms of surveying parents, um, conducting focus groups, um, trying to identify needs of families and students and responding to those. Uh, which is awesome and um, want to encourage that schools and districts continue to do that on a periodic basis. But your SIC is something that is already structured and present and something that your school and district need to make sure it convenes every year. Um, it is a diverse group of stakeholders, including not only school representatives and parent representatives, but also community representatives. And so it can really serve as a springboard for those kinds of ongoing conversations that you need to be having. Um, the survey gives you, uh, it captures a moment in time for families. The SIC is a place that you can go back to over and over again, over time, to check to see how things are going, to recheck, to get new ideas, to, to really, um, inform and infuse your decision making with multiple voices. Um, the diversity on your SIC, ideally your SIC is going to be looking like a microcosm of your, your school community. So it should give you an opportunity to hear from multiple types of stakeholders within your school, including those who are most in need and are facing the greatest challenges during this time. So, SICs, you can use them to get that regular input and feedback. You can also utilize your SIC as a means of communi communicating information out to the broader school community. So in other words, there's some information where, like for example, um, you know, basic facts about health and safety. Um, those facts are really not things that need to be the subject of uh, uh, in-depth discussion. They are what they are. We need to communicate those out to folks so that they know what they are. Um, your members of your SIC can help you figure out what the best way is to communicate with different parts of the school community. They can even take that information out to the school community themselves and um, share it with others. Um, so think of it as, a, your, think of your SIC as a really effective mechanism uh, for having an ongoing two-way communication with the broader school community. And then because you also have community members on your SIC, they can help your school connect with those community resources that you need. Um, I know in, in talking to uh, a number of our community partners through uh, Carolina Family Engagement Center, you know, they really want to help. They're, they're trying to come up with all kinds of ideas. How can we help? Um, if they're on an SIC at a school, they're gonna hear firsthand how they can help and they're gonna know how to connect. And um, instead of making offers that maybe are nice, but not exactly what you need, um, you can have a direct dialogue with those, those community organizations who can get those resources and get them um, to the families that need them most. Yeah, Karen, you're, you're so right. You make up some, some present some really, really valid points uh, that those connections are there if we look for them. Uh, the SIC can help with those. But in order for an SIC to really help in terms of that information sharing, idea sharing, um, they need to be organized. So here in part one, we're going to look at getting organized uh, as an SIC, looking at SIC elections and appointments. Next slide, please. 
Now, SICs can function even during social distancing. I know there's a lot of things going on. Uh, things are very much not like they used to be, and I'm not quite sure whether they're ever going to go back to that after we're able to come back together again. Uh, but the SIC can be a constant in its function for the school community uh, if we uh, take current circumstances into, into account and, and adapt for them. So you can convene your SIC this year. Uh, you can still hold your parent, teacher, and student elections using alternate methods. You could do the electronic methods and low-tech methods as well. You can still appoint community members by e uh, email or phone. Uh, and your ex officio members, those, those folks can be notified by, by email, text, or phone as well. And also for your meetings, SICs can hold virtual SIC meetings on a monthly basis, whether that's through a platform such as we're using here, Zoom, or whether it's a lower tech method such as a conference call, there are technologies that are available for you to be able to hold those meetings, to hold those elections, uh, and they might be something that you find attracts more participants if you institute this in the long run. It may be something that another arrow in your quiver that once we're out from underneath the shadow of COVID-19 that your SIC might be able to use uh, in terms of holding elections uh, and virtual meetings. Uh, but as we as we go forward we need to take a look at or refresh ourselves of the types of SIC members that we have essentially three categories. You've got elect folks, you've got appointed folks, you have ex officio folks. The elected uh, category, you've got parents who elect other parents, teachers who elect other teachers, and students grades 9 through 12 who elect their peers. And in accordance with statute, these all serve staggered uh, two-year term. Now, you ha also have appointed folks on your council, and those are intended to be non-parent, non uh, employee, uh, community members, non-parent taxpayers, and uh, the term of service for those will be uh, discussed in your SIC bylaws, whether that's a year, two years, uh, that's a decision that you can make on the local level for the term of your appointed community members. Now your ex officio members, these are folks who are on your council by virtue of whatever a particular position they might hold within the school community. Uh, state law says there must be at least one ex officio member, that being the principal, but SICs can also add other ex officio members like a, a representative of the PTA or the PTO, uh, perhaps teacher of the year if that teacher hasn't been elected uh, as a teacher to the council. If you have a parent liaison in your school, that individual would be a great person to have in that capacity. And also perhaps uh, a past SIC chair uh, to uh, provide some uh, continuity of work as the SIC uh, trans uh, transitions from one administration to the other. And uh, those ex officio folks will be uh, delineated in your local SIC uh, bylaws. Now, statute talks about a minimum size for school improvement councils. And this, this chart here uh, breaks that down for us. Uh, if, if you're an elementary or a middle school, uh, the, the minimum is two elected parents, two elected teachers, two appointed community members, and at least one ex officio, that being the principal. Uh, you might notice the theme there, two, two, and two. Well, if you're a high school, you also have to incorporate those student members uh, into your SIC. So for, for high schools, the minimum is two parents, two teachers, two students elected by their peers, half as many or three appointed community members, and at least one ex officio member, that being the principal. The statute regarding SICs talks about a two-thirds to one-third ratio of elected individuals to appointed individuals. Uh, if your grasp of uh, fractions is, is like mine, first of all, I feel sorry for you. Uh, but uh, secondly, you can look past the fractions. If you've got twice as many elected people as you do appointed people, uh, you, you are good to go in terms of the minimum size of your school improvement council. Now, while the minimum is called for in statute, there isn't a maximum. There's no ceiling on the number of folks you can have on your school improvement council. But keep in mind that bigger isn't necessarily better. Uh, we work with some school improvement councils that may have 30, 40, and upwards uh, of members that they have. And 
typically what you're looking at is very, very large high schools who want a greater cross representation of parents by grade level and so on, or, or teachers by virtue of subject area and that sort of thing. Uh, so bigger doesn't necessarily mean better because really your SIC should reflect the size and the diversity of your particular school. Um, so it's really not so big that it becomes unwieldy or unmanageable for you. If you are an elementary school with, uh, say, 120 students, having 60 parents on your school improvement council is probably not the best move. Uh, that sounds more like open house than it does a school improvement council. So take a look at that. And there's, you have flexibility on the local level for that. But also keep in mind that you have folks in your school community who want to help out in this work. And folks don't have to be a member of the School Improvement Council to help participate in the work. Uh, everyone can attend meetings, uh, they can serve on committees, or help with other SIC initiatives. So when you're looking at your membership, start small, look at that minimum requirement, and then set a realistic uh, membership goal for your council as you go forward. Karen? Sure, and I would just, um, I just wanted to emphasize that because I know that um, it can be tough, uh, particularly if you haven't got an SIC that's, that's been um, ongoing for a while to get started and really want to encourage you, you know, it's not about the numbers. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I'll be approached by principals and, and they feel really um, like they need to explain to me why they've only got eight people at their SIC meeting. I think that's a pretty good turnout for an SIC meeting. Um, mm -hmm. It's not about, we're not counting the number of bodies in the meeting room. We're talking about what kinds of results that an SIC is able to achieve and how diverse and how well the, the membership of the SIC represents all of the different parts of the school community. Um, an SIC can be extremely effective and it can get lots of folks involved um, in its activities or in its initiatives but for that work, that work of planning and, and uh, needs assessment and some of the other kinds of advisory roles that the SIC plays, it can be very powerful even at the minimum size that's required. So how do we get, how do we find our SIC members? Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, parents, uh, teachers, and students are all uh, required to be elected. And um, by law, SIC elections are required to be held annually and completed by October 15th. So we know that during this time, there are gonna be situations that are gonna arise when it's just unavoidable, there's gonna be a delay, and maybe you're not able to complete that, that election till October 17th. So, you know, we're not, we're understanding of that, but we really wanna encourage everyone to, um, stick as closely as possible to the statutory deadlines just because they'll keep you moving. Um, you don't want to wait until November, December to be able to convene your SIC because frankly the year's pretty much half over by that point and um, it really it really decreases what an SIC can accomplish during the school year. So you want to have elections and again this hasn't changed from previous guidance. Um, you can use any method for your SIC elections that you wish, as long as it's fair and it encourages high levels of participation. And that's especially important when we're talking about uh, parent elections. So how will SIC elections look different this year? Um, the big difference is really gonna be in the parent elections because we've been encouraging folks and, and folks have really taken to heart the advice that um, piggybacking their parent elections to large in-person parent events can really help with both um, recruiting potential SIC members and getting as many people as they can to vote. Um, but obviously that's just not gonna be possible at least this fall. Um, so that, option is not available. So we're going to have to look at some other possibilities. Online tools are available and I think that they can be very efficient um, so long as when you use those tools um, there's an option included for those families who would not be able to access them for lack of technology. Um, teacher elections can look pretty much the same. I'm kind of assuming that most schools are having 
all faculty meetings uh, using Zoom or another platform, just as we're holding this event, um, certainly can have uh, teacher nominations and elections during the course of that meeting online. And with student elections, um, I know a lot of times schools will combine those with student council elections. So if you're holding virtual student council elections, just add the student rep position on the SIC onto that. Or if you're not planning on convening a student council um, and you're serving your school serving grades nine and above, still have to have those student representatives. So you'll need to hold a separate virtual election for that position. Okay, so we wanted to focus um, primarily on peer elections for this particular presentation because that, as I said, is really the, the area that's gonna see the most change um, in terms of you know, having to think of other creative options for, um, for engaging families and getting uh, maximum participation. So just walking you through the steps, um, you're gonna start with uh, nominations, of course, um, and you want to have both ample notice to people of when nominations are going to be and um, how nominations can be made. So we're suggesting that in making um, that information available to families that you use a mix of methods that together are, are calculated to, meet, to reach all families. Obviously, um, there may be families that you've tried everything you can think of you can't reach, but always our goal is to reach all families. Um, some examples of some of the different kinds of methods you might pair together to accomplish this goal. Um, you know, a combination of notice on the school website, uh, email, text, uh, electronically generated um, auto calls, you know, the school marquee, the newsletter, social media, postcards, and there's really, um, there's really three pieces of information that we suggest you include on that, that notice of um, nomination. So number one, who's eligible to be nominated and who can submit a nomination? So um, basically anyone who's a parent, and when we say parent, we are including guardians, we're including kinship caregivers, we're including foster families, anyone who's serving in, uh, the role of a parent for that child uh, and has a, at least one of those children enrolled in your school uh, is eligible to nominate a candidate or be nominated and uh, self-nomination is always okay. Um, then the next thing you want to add, the next piece of information you want to add is how do parents submit that nomination and what's the deadline? And then finally, um, and I think this is really key, please think about adding a few sentences about SIC and what parent representatives do. Um, you know, folks out there, there, there are folks out there, especially in the, the earlier grades who may not have ever heard of an SIC. And even if they have, they may not know what is all, what all is involved or expected if you're a parent representative. So if they don't have that information readily available to them, they may just decide, well, this is one can of worms I'm not going to open. <laughs> but if you just give them a little bit of information about SIC and, and what the, the commitment is that's involved, um, they may think that, okay, that sounds great. I'd like to have an opportunity to, you know, meet with the principal monthly to, to hear what's going on and to share my ideas and my thoughts, you know? So, the, the upshot is spread the word as widely as you can and make it as easy as you can to respond. And again, don't forget those folks who do not have access to internet or other um, technologies. Um, make sure that there's, there's a low tech way for folks to be able to participate if they need to. And then going on to elections, um, you need to give ample notice of elections as well as nominations. You can do that all at one time at the beginning. In other words, if you're sending out, say you're sending out postcards, you only want to send out one postcard. You can say, you know, our notice of SIC elections is going to be from X state to X state. We'll be holding elections from X state to X state. Um, you don't have to do it twice. Um, but that notice of elections should state um, how and when parents can access or receive a ballot, how to submit their vote, and then what the deadline is for submitting their vote. Um, 
if you are giving the notice of elections after nominations, um, we really encourage you to provide a list of candidates and if possible, a bio for each. And that doesn't have to be something that's real involved. Um, we have examples of all of these items on our website in the S SIC elections toolkit. And really all we're talking about here is um, contacting each candidate and asking them if they can submit just a couple of lines about who they are, um, maybe what grade their child is in school, or if they have multiple children, what grades they're in, and maybe just a sentence or two about why they would like to serve on the SIC. Um, that really makes it a much more meaningful process for folks. Um, and then finally, um, like nominations, you can use any method that you choose, but you really need to think about using a mix of methods that are calculated to reach all families. And so we want to make sure that schools know that you can use an electronic survey tool for your parent elections. It may be that that's a very convenient and efficient way for you to conduct um, your elections as your primary tool. Um, your district may already have access to things like SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics or Google Forms, and those can easily be modified into a format that, that will allow you to create a ballot. And, um, you know, as I think Tom mentioned earlier, it's some of these tools may be things that we want to keep using even after the pandemic is over. I know everyone's kind of gotten more familiar with how to get on a virtual meeting or how to use some of the other tools that maybe we were a little um, shy about using previously. They've become like second nature now. But the, the caveat again is always providing an option for folks who do not have internet access. And that might be through, um, for example, using um, a paper ballot and um, sending it home with um, meal deliveries. And, letting folks send it back to meal deliveries, or if you're sending homework packets or other information packets home from the school, including, including that, you know, uh, delivering it through bus drivers or whoever is, is doing that process. So um, just thinking about and being creative about, depending on how your school is operating right now, um, just being intentional about making sure that there is an option for folks who cannot perhaps access things like SurveyMonkey or, or Qualtrics. Okay, so sort of a summary of helpful tips for parent elections. Again, as I mentioned, there is an SIC toolkit available at sic.sc.gov, our website. And it's got templates for no nominations, it's got templates for ballots, it's got uh, a sample of what it might look like if you did a candidate bio sheet. And it's also got a guide um, with suggestions for all the three different kinds of elections you need to have, parent, teacher, and student. Um, if you're thinking that this sounds like a lot of work and you don't have time for this, you've got um, lots of folks to help you. Um, you know, seek out your current SIC members who aren't running this year. You should have um, several folks who are in, returning for their second year and they can certainly help with some of these tasks. Um, as well as other folks um, that may be either teachers or, or school staff. Uh, don't go it on your own. Um, you know, get folks involved and, and get some help in putting this together. So the third thing, the third tip comes from my experience uh, working in the field with school improvement councils. Um, and I get this question quite a bit. So assuming you've tried a mix of methods and you've gotten a nomination notice out there and you've given people plenty of time to respond and the deadline passes and you've got no one. So what do you do? So my suggestion is you could go ahead and have your election, but my suggestion is in that case, um, extend the deadline a little bit further for the nominations and do some targeted outreach. So think about, you know, there's a couple options or a couple strategies that you might use to do some targeted outreach. So one might be, you know, is there a method of notifying people that we haven't tried yet? Maybe we only put it up on the school marquee and on the website. Well, maybe that wasn't enough. Maybe we could try using the automated calls or sending an email out, a mass email out. Um, so you might want to try 
getting folks by trying some additional methods of notification. But you may have tried every single thing I've got listed down there. So maybe it's, maybe it's just the situation where people need a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of um, sense of that when you sent that notice out and you were looking for people to run, you really meant them, not just the other guy. So one of the things you can do is think back to your own experience. Who are the parents that you can think of that maybe um, seem like they have an interest, maybe they're not the most active parents, but they show some interest in being active. Maybe it's um, you're talking to teachers because sometimes teachers see which parents seem to have an interest in certain areas. And again, SIC isn't for everybody. Everybody has their sort of um, set of skills and talents and interests. You know, I, I know that for me, um, I actually love both PTA and SIC because I love to cook, so I'm good with PTA. And I also love to be a policy geek, so I love SIC. But you may just have fo some folks who really, SIC is not for them. But you may have some folks that show signs of, of being interested in sort of the more, um, uh, well, geeky kinds of things, as I call it for myself, but in more interest in those, those uh, those meat and potatoes kinds of issues that um, SICs deal with. So, um, you know, see if you can find out who some of those people are. You know, don't just stick with your own knowledge, but reach out to teachers or maybe some uh, folks in the community that have a lot of parents in their church or in their, uh, their after school um, recreation league. You know, see if you can get some suggestions and then make some targeted calls. We know that parents engage more readily with school when they get a personal ask. It's just the way it is. And um, the only thing I would suggest is that you be careful when you are making those targeted asks um, to make sure that you have done your homework in terms of doing outreach to everyone. Because the one thing that can go wrong with that approach is if it starts to take on the parents that you're handpicking hand folks who you want to serve, have serve on the SIC. That may be absolutely not the case. You're picking someone who a teacher recommended that you don't even know, but you just want to avoid that appearance because that can, that can discourage folks later on. So those are just some suggestions, but doing that extra work early on can really save you time later on. Um, and then for those folks, and I have these SICs as well, who get to the election and they've got either Two open, maybe they've got two openings on their SIC and they have two candidates. And they say to me, great, I don't need to have an election. I've got my spots filled. And I kind of say, well, no, really you need to have an election even though you've got exactly the right number of folks. And there's two reasons for that. Uh, one is that, and probably the most important is that is required by law, the statute specifically says that SIC elections need to be held annually it also helps you keep track of when their term starts and ends. Um, and you may ask, well, what's the point? Um, I would suggest adding a space for write-ins so that if there are folks who missed all the earlier efforts to notify them, they want to write in their name, show their interest, um, that that's an opportunity for them to do that. Um, the other piece is that if you don't hold that election, again, we want folks to understand that um, SICs are not a uh, handpicked group of people. SICs are, are the representatives that have been elected by their peers. So when there is no election, it, it may get easier next year not to have an election and so on and so forth. And, and you kind of find yourself sliding into a habit of, of just calling a couple of folks and inviting them to be on the SIC. Um, if you haven't had a history of an SIC, that may be where you finally end up, but that's really the last resort and it's really after you've tried everything else. So having that election is important. Now, if you, let's say that you've gone to the election and you've got two openings on your SIC and you have zero parent, parent candidates, same answer, you need to have that election because A, it may, um, it may get the attention of one or two folks who maybe didn't get the memo about the nominations, but are still interested. So you may end up getting some folks that way. And second, it is required by state law and you do want to 
make sure that you've made every effort possible to to elect members as opposed to handpicking them. So those are my tips. Um, if you're in category three or category four in terms of tips, please don't feel like you're alone or that you have to be embarrassed about it or you can't talk to it. We talk to folks all the time who are having are, are finding themselves in these two categories. And it can take time and effort and patience to, to build uh, a, a strong group of candidates who are coming up from year to year. But it's worth the effort. And um, again, we're here to meet you where you're at. We're not here to tell you what you haven't done or what you maybe wish you had done. We're here to, to really work with you moving forward and to help you identify some of these strategies and to, to help you build a strong SIC. Yeah, that's right, Karen. We have to take a look at that because uh, folks can sometimes find their SICs in, in that particular position. And sometimes it's just time to, to, to rebuild. And, uh, you know, we have uh, the expertise here and the resources to, to help you, to help you do that, to get your, uh, SIC moving uh, properly uh, in the right direction. All right, you've had your elections. What do you do after your elections are over? Well, the first thing is you want to notify all the candidates of the results, uh, and you want to do that individually before uh, those results are announced uh, publicly. Uh, you want to thank those candidates who were unsuccessful in running for election uh, for their participation, because obviously they indicated they have an interest and uh, they just weren't elected at that particular point in time. But let them know that their interest is still valued. They're still needed and welcome to participate in, in SIC meetings and committees and, and other work that the SIC undertakes. Then, of course, you want to let your school community know what the results of the election uh, were. And then it's important to save those election records and ballot counts for at least uh, several years. And one particular thing that uh, this particularly helps with is uh, sometimes parents due to uh, a change in work situation or they may have to move out of the area or something like that will have to have to step down from the school improvement council if you've got your your election records and your ballots uh, ballot counts available you can take a look at that and see who the next highest vote getter was and there is somebody right there uh, who is present for you to, to perhaps fill that slot. So keeping those records and the ballot counts are, are very important for a number of reasons, but certainly for that reason primarily. So after the elections are over and you still don't have any parent members, what do you do? Well, of course, really what we want you to do is we want you to convene your SIC with the members that you've got uh, because the, no work can be done uh, to benefit the school and the school community through the SIC if you're not meeting. So convene with the members that you have on hand. And then what you can do is with that group, you could assess perhaps why you haven't found two parents to serve on your SIC. Did they not hear about it? Do they not understand what the SIC is? Any number of different reasons. And that way you can make a, a plan of action to address what those causes might be. And you don't have to necessarily assume that you know what the cause is. Ask your parents. Ask your parents why uh, those folks did not come forward uh, in the nomination process or the election process to serve as elected parents to the council. And then once you've done that, you can set a goal as a school improvement council. You can set a goal and make a plan to identify at least two parent members to serve uh, on the SIC. And sometimes, as Karen mentioned, sometimes this takes a targeted approach uh, and finding uh, someone you know, uh, perhaps or someone you know someone who knows someone, but also it's important too is to reach out to some of those folks who, who you don't know, uh, because it's those, those folks have uh, just as many valuable insights and energies and talents as folks whom you do know. So set that goal and make a plan in some fashion to identify two parent members of, for your SIC. Now looking at SIC appointments, and these are those community members who are appointed by the principal. Again, looking primarily for non-parent, non-staff taxpayers in your community. I think that's particularly important to pay attention to. 
uh, because if you take a look at just any given community across this across this country uh, anywhere between 70 and 75 percent of the people in a community do not have children in school but they are taxpayers and they see the impact that school taxes can have on the property taxes or on their on their tax bills every year from the county. Uh, it's not so much uh, for residential homeowners now in terms of property taxes, but for retiring bond debt and those sorts of things. They see that they've got some of their money going toward the support of local schools, and so therefore they've got a vested interest. So look for those individuals who aren't parents or employed by the district who can bring some resources or particular expertise to your SIC. Uh, who can serve in that capacity to to help link the school with families who are who are not yet engaged uh, in in the life of your school, and also those individuals who can help build support for your school within the entire school community. And uh, our SIC handbook, which is available uh, for uh, for reading and for download from our website sic.sc.gov, there are suggestions on who you might look to to serve uh, as those appointed. Of community members. Okay, so we can't find community members to serve on our SIC. We do hear this too from time to time. And sometimes we have to think outside of the box. Sometimes we got to throw the entire box away. Sometimes we have to round up not the usual suspects, as the movie says, but the unusual suspects. And this provides a list here of some avenues where you can approach community members to help serve and do the work of the SIC. And you've got from library to local business owners, maybe a business partner with your school, healthcare providers, other social service agencies, uh, maybe law, law and other professional firms, maybe like an architect or something like that, local law enforcement. Uh, also, faith-based organizations can be very important uh, and have a real vital voice uh, on your SIC. So take a look at this list. Think about who you might know who fills some of these categories. And these are folks and areas that you can look toward to help find community members uh, to serve on your school improvement council. And finally, um, as we're wrapping up this uh, first section on uh, how to get your membership together, um, just want to emphasize the importance of infusing equity into every step of organizing your SIC. Um, so we know that there are folks who either historically have not been, who has historically have faced multiple barriers to um, accessing educational excellence for their children. There are families that continue to, are, are newly facing barriers, especially that perhaps those families, you know, where jobs have been lost due to the economic impact of the pandemic. Um, but we're here to serve all families. And so that means that one size doesn't necessarily fit all and it may take a little more work and intention to um to recruit members to our sic in a way that makes sure that that ensures that our sic really does reflect um, all the voices of our school's community um, so there are a lot of ways to think about this but if we're talking about in terms of organizing the SIC, it, it may start really at the beginning when you think about how many members are you going to have on your SIC? How many parent representatives do you need? You know, if you're a school that has just a wide variety of different types of families, a lot of diversity, you may need more parent representatives or more parent community representatives to, to reflect that on your SIC. Um, when you're doing the nomination and election process, again, sharing that information broadly using multiple kinds of methods of notice so that you are reaching out to those folks who may not be part of that, that sort of 80% of folks who are going to be reached through the website, for example. Um, also, using trusted brokers is a really important strategy. So in other words, if you've got a uh, uh, 
a, a core of, of families who do not speak English as their first language, but you know that they all are involved with um, a community group that's, that's operated by a local church. Maybe you can make contact with that church and ask them to serve as that broker in terms of getting the word out to those families about opportunities related to school improvement councils in a language that they can understand. Um, again, intensifying efforts to reach underrepresented families, you may have to work harder to reach those representatives of those families, but it is part of our work if we're committed to equity. Um, and again, using those multiple methods to reach out to all families. And then with the appointment and ex officio positions, you can also work to, um, to broaden the representation and the number of voices that are on your SIC. So for example, with a, appointments um, as a principal, you can think about, you know, maybe, um, you know, there's, there's a group that is not represented on your SIC. Um, maybe it's, it's homeless families. They, they just, they haven't responded. You, maybe you know you have some homeless families, but for a variety of reasons, they feel like they can't participate. Maybe as an appointment, a community member appointment, you can approach someone who's involved in providing services to those, those homeless families. Um, so that they can serve as a representative for their voice. Um, families of students with disabilities, again, that's another um, group of families that sometimes feels isolated from the mainstream, but who are really eager and want to participate. Um, so uh, maybe if you don't have parent representatives from that group, maybe um, you look to a local organization that may serve those families to, to provide voice. Um, ex officio position is another place where you might be able to um, help increase the diversity or at least ensure that voices of all families are represented. Um, I, one example that might come to mind is, um, for example, uh, having an ex officio, creating an ex officio position for the lead uh, SEL teacher or ESL teacher, sorry. Um, creating a position on the SIC for that so that there's always, you know, there's always going to be uh, one person from the school that's going to be representing those voices. Obviously, you'd like to have family represented as well, multiple voices, but making sure that there's at least one individual on that SIC that's going to have a connection to that, that group of families. So that, those are some examples of how you can think about infusing equity as you're organizing your SIC. And then finally, don't forget to report your SIC's membership to the SC SIC member network. Um, the deadline is November 15th every year. And again, you know, we recognize that, that uh, there's a lot going on. And if there's, you know, some unavoidable circumstance that, that, you know, causes you to be a little bit late on that, you know, we obviously know that that's probably going to occur. Um, for a few folks, but please try as hard as you can to comply with those statutory deadlines. Um, the, the membership reporting requirement is another requirement that's um, in state law, but it's also important to you because you want to get credit if you've got your SIC together. You want to get credit for the fact that you organized it and that you're operating. So if you don't report, the public can come to our um, member network and see a, a bunch of, uh, you know, red checks and looks like you haven't convened when you fact you have. So you want to get credit for that so that the public can see that you're in compliance. Um, it's a way for the school community to see who is representing them on their SIC. Um, one thing that's very important is to please, please try very hard to include uh, correct email addresses and contact information for SIC members, particularly those who are parents or community members, because if you just use the school contact information down the list, um, uh, the information that we send out electronically is not going to get to your parent and um, community members. And although we are very careful and very conscious about um, not wanting to overwhelm folks with a lot of unwanted information, there are a few things that are important pieces of information that we do need to get out to school improvement council uh, members, particularly when you have, for example, a parent who's a chair 
um, if you leave out that email address because you didn't ask and, and you didn't follow up on that, you may know how to reach that individual, but we don't. Um, so you really want to be um, take that, that little extra time during an SIC meeting to collect everyone's email addresses so you can report those. And um, if you have questions, you need help, we are always ha happy to do that. You can access the member network through sic.sc.gov, and um, we've got the phone number and email addresses there for additional assistance. Just call us, and someone's always willing to and happy to help you with that. Excellent. Those are those are great. Those are great points, particularly the importance of that contact information because we want to let your SIC know about about changes, about things that are coming up. Uh, things that affect the life of school improvement councils, and we can only do that to get in contact with folks. And that's very, very important in terms of like newsletters or updates and those sorts of things. So please, you know, please pay attention to including those those email addresses when you report your member uh, member network uh, information. Uh, so we come to part two. And uh, part two is convening your SIC, particularly convening your SIC in this age of pandemic that we see ourselves in. And it can be, uh, certainly has been daunting and a, you know, a life altering experience for so many folks, but there are meeting options for school improvement councils during uh, the pandemic. And uh, next slide, please. And we have stressed the use of virtual virtual options. Uh, I see have been doing this, uh, uh, and more and more are doing this, and have uh, to do so. There are a variety of platforms out there, like what we're using today, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, Go to Meeting. Uh, take a look at what uh, might be available in your district, in your school, and see if you could utilize that or. Perhaps even, uh, you know, make hotspot or phone options available for those members of your SIC who might not have internet access. And then share and post the information on how members of the public can virtually attend your SIC meetings. Since SIC meetings are technically to be uh, open meetings to everyone, uh, share that information so that they can have uh, input and access to the information that your SIC is taking a look at and, and considering. So post that information about how they can attend virtually, uh, where you post your SIC meeting schedule. And also if you're using uh, like the conference call option or what we call now the low tech option, um, if possible, provide a number or text for uh, technical help, not only just for the telephone conference, but also for uh, your video conference. If you have somebody uh, available who has uh, the skills uh, to help uh, with any technological issues that may arise as you're holding your meeting. Um, make sure that that number is available so folks can reach out for help. And with those telephone, those low tech telephone conference calls, they can work as well. So just make sure that your public has access to uh, those call in numbers. Also, I know some SIC meetings who have utilize Facebook Live for this. So there is stuff out there uh, that is available uh, so that you can have and conduct your virtual SIC meetings, uh, allowing folks to participate as they can in this new situation we find ourselves in. Yeah, and Tom, I would just add on that if, um, if folks are looking for suggestions because um, SICs are considered public bodies within the, the scope of the South Carolina uh, Freedom of Information Act, one place you might get some suggestions from is you're looking to see how your school board is, is holding their uh, meetings or how your town council is meeting, holding their meetings because they, um, they are in a similar boat in the sense of, you know, they are public bodies that need to provide access to citizens um, when they're meeting. So, you know, if you're a little at sea about, you know, how do I do this, you might just um, just ask around, ask a couple of those folks how they're doing it, and it may give you uh, a good suggestion um, for how to hold your SIC meetings and provide that access to the public. 
Oh, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great point. This would be a time where it's okay to copy off of somebody else's paper. If it's working for somebody else and you check in with that with them to see how it's working for them, it might work for you as well. Uh, so, so when you go about convening your first SIC meeting, there are a couple of things that we want you to keep in mind as you go forward of that. First of all, is when you're setting a date and time. Uh, the chair will work with the principal to help coordinate this. Uh, and to send this information out uh, for consideration by the full SIC. You could try using a doodle poll or an email with responses to, to help set a date and time. But when you're, do, when you're setting these dates and times, please be very mindful that you want to schedule your meetings at times that are also good for parent and community representatives, as well as your school personnel. Uh, an SIC meeting at 3.30 in the afternoon might not be the best time for parents and community representatives to take part because, gee whiz, they might be working. Uh, so take a look at what is going to work best for your particular situation. And then with all of your new and your returning SIC members, uh, make, make additional calls as well as uh, sending just, a, just an email for that, for that personal touch uh, and welcoming them to the School Improvement Council. And remember to post your public notice of the meeting as soon as possible. And you can post a copy of your agenda uh, at least 24 hours in advance. You can do that on your website. You can, uh, you can do that uh, meeting times, post that on your school marquee, as Karen mentioned earlier. Uh, the, the plain and simple way to do it is to, to post a copy of that agenda, tape it up to the wall uh, by the door of the main office at least 24 hours in advance uh, to provide that aspect of uh, public notice that SIC meetings uh, need to follow. We're taking a look at some agenda items for that first meeting. Uh, one of your first orders of business is going to be electing officers. And SICs uh, generally have three or four officers, uh, maybe a chair and a vice chair or a chair or co-chairs. Uh, to help with the work, certainly a secretary who is going to be there and function like the secretary of just about any organization uh, to uh, to take the minutes, make sure the records are maintained, to help uh, ease in, in uh, distributing uh, minutes, copies of minutes and uh, agendas and that sort of thing. Uh, and those the duties of all those officers are are uh, mentioned in the SIC handbook, so you have that as a reference to find out what the specific uh, roles of those officers are. You will notice that there is no office of treasurer listed, and that is uh, by design. Uh, SICs uh, don't need to be worried about handling money. Uh, they shouldn't be having bank accounts. They're not necessarily fundraising organizations. There are other organizations in the life of your school that can tend uh, to those needs, so you don't have a need for a treasurer, nor do uh, we, we certainly caution you and advise you not to deal with money in any way, shape, or form. You create a meeting schedule. We recommend at least eight meetings a year. Again, remember the needs of all members when you're selecting your days and times. And of course, with those meeting schedules and agendas, uh, post them to the website or some other publicly available options, such as the entrance to the school office. And then also make sure that your SIC members have access to materials that they will need to do their work on the council. The SIC handbook is available for download uh, from our website. Uh, members should have a current set of the SIC bylaws, which should be fairly up to date. Those you should go back and take a look at every couple of years to make sure that uh, form uh, follows uh, in terms of uh, what is set forth in the bylaws, in terms of what operations look like. And also every member should have access to a copy of your school's five-year school improvement plan. One of the primary roles of an SIC is to provide input and advice uh, on that five-year plan and the annual updates to it. So for SIC members to, to really be uh, to really be functioning in their full capacity. They need to have uh, access to that plan so that they can provide that input and that advice going forward. And Tom, one thing I might suggest also just for this year, um, you might consider also including a copy of the school reopening plan or a summary thereof, um, just because 
even though we all have plans um, and those may already be in place and decided upon, A, it'll help if your school improvement council members understand the plan and can answer questions that folks they come into contact with may have, but also this is such a um, quickly changing landscape that we know some of those decisions may need to be revisited at various times or there may be various options that folks aren't aware of. So just again, thinking about using your SIC as a, a, um, a method of, of or a, a, a channel for two-way communication, both into the school, but also out to the broader school community, um, taking the time to um, help your SIC members be familiar with um, some of those school reopening plans or other new policies or rules or, uh, you know, uh, health requirements could really um, help in terms of getting that information out to the broader school community. And that, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point is to take a look at, at that so that that available, uh, that information is readily available because we are in uh, the times they are a changing and uh, we're all having to adapt to what is the new normal if we want to classify it as normal and that will help. But looking at some normal procedures for SIC meetings, they still apply uh, here in the age of COVID-19. And that being that the chair and the principal prepare and post the agenda at least 24 hours in advance of the meeting and, and distribute that agenda and minutes uh, with the help of the secretary uh, in advance via email, text, fax, regular mail, any combination thereof, so that all of your SIC members have access to those materials before the next meeting. Uh, you want to approve minutes from the prior meeting uh, and take minutes of the current meeting. It's always good to get those minutes out, uh, the draft minutes out to your membership before uh, they sit down around the SIC table, so they'll have a, have a chance to take a look at that and uh, that way make a, a better and more informed decision as there needs to be any corrections or, or updates to the minutes. And keep in mind too that your agenda and your meeting minutes are all public documents within the scope of the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act and they must be maintained. There's a number of different ways you can maintain them. I've seen SICs who post this information on the SIC tab on the homepage of their school's website. That's great. Uh, but also, too, the old tried and true have a folder there in the front office that stays there regardless of whoever is the principal or the chair or whatever. Uh, and that information goes in there and not only serves as an accounting of your public documents, but also serves as a, as a historical record of the acts of your school improvement council. And then when you're convening, whether you're convening virtually or in person, uh, certainly a quorum is maintained to take any official SIC action. Take a look at your bylaws to see what constitutes a quorum for your council. Typically, we're looking at a simple majority plus one. Uh, so you must have those folks uh, present for the meeting, whether they be virtual, uh, all present physically, or some combination thereof. And then, of course, the SIC chair is, is the individual who really leads the SIC meeting. The SICs are there to provide a resource uh, for uh, the building leadership, for the principals and the assistant principals. And the, the flip side of that coin is uh, those folks, principals, and so on, are, are there as a resource to uh, the uh, the chair and the SIC itself when they meet. So be the chair who leads the meeting uh, with uh, uh, input and resources and information uh, provided uh, by uh, the principal. Even as we're looking at the impact of COVID-19 and what of those will remain even after we're no longer socially distancing. Uh, SICs are here for the long haul. They've been uh, in South Carolina public schools uh, for well over 40 years. And there's a reason for that. It's because schools need that continued collaboration with families and community members over the long term, regardless of whether uh, it's a, it's a uh, hopefully a, a shorter term uh, situation that we're facing with the pandemic but just with the normal operations and issues and challenges that schools would have on a, on a daily basis. So SICs are there to help with that and to be a resource uh, 
to address academic and social emotional needs resulting from extended school closures as we're seeing now, but also with the goals of the school in meeting those, uh, those academic goals, those school climate goals uh, that they have even during uh, years where we're not facing a pandemic. All right, so where to go for help? Always important. Services that we have available through uh, South Carolina School Improvement Council. So we say this often and we really mean it. Um, South Carolina School Improvement Council is here to help. Um, so a couple places you can look for more information. Uh, the website at sic.sc.gov has um, a lot of free materials and information that I think you'll find helpful in um, going about convening your SIC this year. Um, there's the electronic newsletter, Council News, as well as uh, Tom's uh, SIC 180 videos that um, are uh, providing you with a snapshot of, of really timely uh, topics as we go through the year. Uh, social media is a great place not only to find out what's going about what's going on with SICs, but also what's going on more broadly within the education community here in South Carolina. Um, you'll find a number of uh, other training opportunities um, that SICs can take advantage of. Um, and again, there's always the email and telephone call. Um, we are continuing to work. We have been working all through the pandemic and we continue to do so. Um, and we're here to answer your questions and to provide you with some guidance. And then we have the additional resources now of the Carolina Family Engagement Center that you can update or you can access at uh, cfec.sc.gov. And that's a great point, Karen. I mean, to take a look at those resources that are available, and uh, we, Karen mentioned uh, the training resources that are available. And you know, right now, uh, what we have historically done is done. Uh, in-person trainings on the district level, which of course right now we're not able to do that uh, because of the social distancing requirements uh, as we face uh, COVID-19. So we're, we're taking a look at how we can adapt the training to perhaps be in a format similar to what we have here. Uh, so take a look at our website and, and, and listen to your SIC district contact as they have more information on what that training might look like uh, in, in the coming months. Great, thank you, Tom. And I would just um, conclude for my part by just really encouraging you all to, to um, really be intentional about um, continuing your SICs uh, over this period of time um, and being inclusive, particularly of those um, families that are facing the greatest challenges during this time. Um, I've gone to a lot of SICs and a lot of SIC meetings across the state. And I can tell you two things. One is that it's not always easy to put an SIC together, but I can also tell you that even in the most difficult surface of circumstances, it can be done. And I've seen it done, I've seen it done well. Um, it's never been more important to have relationships with families to be communicating on a regular basis with families and um, to have that, that sense of we're all in this together because we are, none of us can do it by ourselves. So just really, really encourage you to um, put the time um, and the effort needed to pull the SIC together because it will pay back many times over as you go through the school year. Excellent points, Karen, thank you. All right. And well, attached here, the last page that we have here is we have an appendix of some oh. free online <laughs> resource examples. And this is, this is some, some examples that Karen put together of things that are out there. And I know there, we, we know that there are more of them out there, uh, but this is just some sample, a sample of some of them uh, without necessarily having been vetted or endorsed in any way, shape or form uh, to take a look at how you can uh, use sites for survey options, uh, 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 virtual elections, and those sorts of things. So that list is here for you to, to take a look at to see what might work best 
uh, for you. If you find something that looks great and it's not on this list, let us know so that we can share that with folks. And also to share with us your experience uh, as your SIC goes through uh, this period of convening virtually uh, on how it's, how it's working for you. Is it work, you know, is it, do we need some improvement in that area? Do, is it, uh, is it, things are going great. Uh, we'd like to hear from you on that. So please keep that in mind as well as we go forward as we start this new school year. So Karen, I think that's, that's about it that we have in terms of slides. Is there anything that you would like to add? No, just okay. hang in there and, <laughs> and uh, we hope to see you sometime soon in person. Yes, indeed. And thank you for taking the time to, uh, uh, to, spend, uh, to spend the last hour or so with us as we go through this. Uh, we, Karen and I and the entire SIC staff, uh, appreciate what you do. Uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, that collaborative uh, leadership, if you will, in working with your uh, school improvement councils and the various aspects of your school community. And also to, uh, you know, you had questions about the member network. Do you want to share with us some, some information on uh, what your SIC is doing? Uh, Claudia Parnell of our office is also available. She's our digital web at web coordinator. Uh, share with her maybe your stories. Uh, talk, look to her for some assistance on that SSC member network. Uh, the three of us here, uh, Karen, uh, Claudia, and myself, we're here because of you. And we want to help you and your SIC be as, as successful as it can be. And uh, that's why we wanted to take this time to provide these, this new look and this new time uh, of uh, what we can do with our SICs going forward in this time of pandemic. So on behalf of Karen Otter, our SESIC Associate Director and our, co our Project Director for the Carolina Family Engagement Center, again, I'm Tom Hudson, Executive Director of the South Carolina School Improvement Council and Co-Director of the Carolina Family Engagement Center, thanking you for taking this time and thanking you for the work that you do that is so very important for our schools and students. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh.